just preparing our hearts as we go into communion later in the service as well, that we have so much to praise him for. It's what this whole series has been. But the number one thing that we have to praise him for is the grace that he gave us on the cross. And that's what this song says. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood.
the sermon last week, Pastor Dave talked about this song, There is a fountain filled with blood, that great glorious hymn. We're going to sing that this morning. If you want to stand with us and join us.
are so thankful for so great a salvation. Lord, we can sing, we can rejoice, but Lord, we are so thankful that you have taken all of our, our sin, our rebellion, all of our sins, and you've given us your righteousness. That's the greatest exchange in the universe. Thank you, Jesus, that you set us free, that you put our feet upon the rock to stay. Thank you, Lord, for so great a salvation. Thank you that you're blessed and, and always well. Cleanse the violent sin. Thank you, Jesus, that your blood is still available today to cleanse us and to redeem us. Amazing God, amazing grace. We love you, we worship you. Thank you for who you are. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated. song, I was just thinking about a story I heard many years ago about a young disciple coming to the Master. He said, Master, he said, I would really like to know more of Jesus. I would really like to draw closer to Jesus. And so the Master takes him out in the river, takes him to a deep place, says, kneel down. The young disciple going on, puts his hand on top of his head and puts him under the water. This is interesting. A minute goes by, two minutes, by this time he's pretty well gasping for air. He wondered what's going on and the master won't let him go. Holding his head on the water until now he's fighting, fighting. He's actually fighting against it and he comes bursting up to the water and says, what was that about? Sort of where it is, isn't it? This is the air we breathe. We take it for granted. But I pray that we want the Lord even more than our next breath. Amen. His wonderful presence. Amen. The announcement guy once again. Welcome everybody. Welcome to those in the car. Welcome to those on the internet. And uh, at this time, we'd like to dismiss Sunday school. If all the kids could uh, exit at the back there, we all up to uh, age uh, 12, 5 to 12. Just some real quick announcements, Use, uh, the usual ones. We have men's prayer Tuesday at 10, and we also have the ladies at 9.30, the, lady, uh, the ladies' Bible study. This year, we are going to try once again for our Seder dinner. Now, this has been postponed for two years, but we're hoping that we can do it. We've been speaking with Jeff Futers from First Century Foundation. He will be leading us in this uh, Seder dinner. If you've never been to a Seder meal, you need to come. It is, it is amazing when you see Christ uh, through the Seder meal. So there will be more info coming. We know that a bunch of you bought tickets two years ago that was canceled to COVID, and, and we'll try to figure all that out. So just mark on your calendar, April 16th. It'll be a, it'll be a chicken dinner, and it'll be here at the church. I just have one more announcement. Uh, the cafe is open. So, uh, yeah, you know, there's something about Christianity and food that just go together. <laughs> and so by all means, please stay after with a joy of coffee and, and some refreshments and uh, let's stay and have some fellowship. And this week we have the final uh, letter in our praise series, which is Evoke. So Pastor, if you could evoke us for whatever you're going to do. Amen. back in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. As I uh, mentioned a bit earlier, this, today is the last message in a series of six on the word of praise. And when you take praise as an acronym, P-R-A-I-S-E, and you read about praise from Genesis to Revelation, you will come across these six words that Pastor Dave and I have been preaching on. The first message was on the presence of God, when we praise God, as we did this morning, as we were singing those songs, I just felt that the presence of God being evoked from our praise. And, and that's what we're taught takes place in the Bible. 
The second message was about Jesus Christ being our Redeemer. A Redeemer is someone who takes back something that we've got ourselves into, and that is sin. If we die in sin, we go to hell. And so Jesus was sent by God to take us back from our sin. Adoration was the third message. It has to do with our deep love and respect for God. When you adore something earthly, you, you will do physical things to, to show an outward display of it. But to adore God comes from our heart. And that's what God judges. The fourth message was on integrity. That is the quality of God's honesty and his moral principles, which become ours when we praise God. And then last week, Pastor Dave talked about singing, because singing throughout the Bible is an expression that uh, we, we adore God through because of our adoration and respect for God, that is just an expression of praise. And uh, as an illustration of Pastor Dave's message last week, how many people were here and you heard him saying, it doesn't matter if you sing uh, on tune or not, okay, you, you saw that, right? Um, we have a clip. Now, uh, Flo, Dave's wife, first sent me a clip, but it was Dave singing off too, but he was in the shower, so we, we didn't want to show that one, but she came up with another one, and if we could just maybe have that brought up, maybe just about 40 seconds. This is a younger Dave. The whole truth. principles, 
which when we praise God become a part of us. When we praise God, we're becoming like God. We are worshiping God who created us. Now last week we heard that singing is a natural response of praising God. And today we're going to hear about this evoking of God in our lives because I want us to realize even when you don't feel like it, even when you're put off by what's happening in the world, there are reasons to still praise God in your life. Psalm 77, verse 14, it says, it's God's works that evokes our wonder. When you look at God's creation, you can believe the worldly teaching that it's just evolution, or you can believe God's word that says, no, it's God's creation. And there's a huge difference between the two. Being preoccupied with worldly things is what tends to keep us distracted from the godly things. And the question is, what's more important to you? Is it the temporal worldly things? Or is it the eternal things? The question is, what is it? What is it that you are so wrapped up about? Is it about God? Or is it the things of the world? Now, with the big picture being what's going on in the world, God's word, and humanistic philosophy and teaching, the big picture having to do with praising God, let's focus our attention how we evoke God's presence in our life and the world as it relates to praise. Now, the reason an idea of evoking praise towards God comes up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I'm going to read to you in just a moment, verses 12 to 28. This is where we read of practical instructions concerning Christian virtues. Three quick points, I'm not going to expound upon them, but you can come back to this chapter and read the verses, and the Holy Spirit will speak to you as he's spoken to me. Anytime you read God's word, God is going to speak into your spirit. The first thing that we read of in these, these uh, verses of 1 Thessalonians 5 is that we are to uphold spiritual leaders. Last week I was in Toronto for a couple of days of meetings from pa with pastors from all over Canada. Uh, sorry, from Ontario, east and west, north and south. And we got to share some of our stories, what's happening in our churches, where we want to go. And this morning I got a text message. Somebody was reaching out. I don't know if it was on purpose or by accident. But it seemed to be related to another person, another church, and I, I sent it off to them. But this person was contemplating taking their life just this morning. And so I pray for him. You might want to keep him in prayer. His name is Sean. I'll leave it at that. But he, he, he was indicating, I'm sorry I failed. I'm just going to end it all. And I just pray right now that, Lord, you're with Sean, wherever he is, whoever he is. I, I couldn't get that message out of my heart when we were singing this morning these songs. You likely do not realize, maybe you won't even believe or understand what spiritual leaders face in their life. Attacks of all sorts. And I just pray that you keep us in prayer. Do not put us on a pedestal. That would be wrong to do. We're all on the same plane here. We're all just humans. We're all flesh with temptations. But you need to pray for those who are in leadership because of the immense pressure, uh, the decision-making, the, the things that we go through on a regular basis. Secondly, in these verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you will read some very good instruction on basic Christian living. I encourage you to go home and, and read it for yourself and let the Lord speak to you. And thirdly, very important, especially in this day and age, how to discern things spiritually. We can discern things on the physical realm by our senses, by our knowledge, and read into things. But the spiritual things that go on in this world, Ephesians chapter 6, talks about this very clearly. We don't see them. We don't smell them. We don't touch them. We don't hear them. But we know they're at work in our lives. There are evil spirits that are at work in this world. And they torment us. They cause all sorts of mental problems. A lot of the issues that humanity have to do, the medical realm will say it's this. The spiritual word of God would say it has more to do with the spiritual. And we need to be aware of that. When God sees you and I, if we are truly his followers, living by these crucial Christian behaviors of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 
He promises us this, that his grace will be upon us, and he will be there to help sanctify us through and through as we live out our lives. Let's look at those verses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 to 28. It says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor amongst you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace amongst yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, brothers meaning brothers and sisters, those in the faith, admonish the idle and encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak, be patient with them all, and see that no one repays another evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God. God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything and hold fast to that which is good. Test everything. In this day of age and deceit, test everything. Abstain from every form of evil. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us, Paul says, and greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. Now, I'm not suggesting we do that. Uh, if you knew the culture that Paul was speaking in, that was a Near Eastern culture. I, I remember living when I was in Eastern Europe in the early 80s, and I would go to Romania or Hungary or Yugoslavia, that you meet some old grizzled man you've never met before, but because it's a house gathering or church gathering, they just accepted you as a brother in the faith. And they come up, and the first time, I remember, it was like a kiss on the cheek, and then it was another kiss on this cheek, and it was back to the kiss, always three kisses, at least where I was in that world at that time. And you, you have to be careful. you you, you got to bear that cheek, because if they're hugging you and bringing you, and sometimes you get it on the lip, and you're just kind of <laughs> biting that. And I... That sticks out to me when I read that Greek with a holy kiss. Um, let's leave that alone here in our Western culture, and let's just uh, stick with the handshake. Verse 27, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all brothers. This is information that needs to be shared, to, to, to share with others about uh, what First Cor or what First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5 is talking about with basic Christian living, uh, living uh, in love for one another and not judging. And then finally it says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And God's grace will be with us if we practice what God's word teaches us. It's, it's, it's simple. It's, it's hard to do, but the instructions are simple. If you're in the word of God and you live according to the word of God, God's grace and mercy is going to be upon you. Now, while we were discussing the word evoke, as we're doing that, I, I'd like to point this one thing out, very crucial of this day and age. We need to be very careful with social media evoking responses in our personal lives. Social media uh, and YouTube, I have to write these all down here, Instagram, Snapshot, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Discard, Reddit, and it goes on and on and on, are famous for duping people into believing lies all sorts of deceit. Too often we're bombarded with images and video clips that are misleading and some are just downright purposefully full of lies about what's really going on in our world. From political issues to war to global agendas to health mandates, medical science or not, on and on and on. We need to be careful to ponder things in our heart before believing in and passing on to others information and images of things that we actually don't know for sure are even factual. Hello? Hello? Yes. All right, some of us get caught up in this. These kinds of things can evoke undesirable responses, and that is the purpose of deceit. That is the purpose of our enemy, Satan, who wants to destroy your lives, your health, relationships. Things that are not true are a major factor in deceiving people. And the Bible repeats this reality over and over and over. And in fact, it says that these things will be a major indication 
of the soon second coming of Jesus Christ to rapture his believers away before all hell really breaks loose here on earth. There are so many things going on around the world that are bringing division and judgment between people and nations. And then we have God's word. God's word that talks about love, turn the cheek, don't treat others with disrespect, but treat others the way you would have them treat you. John chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus says, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I don't give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. And yet we see people with troubled hearts and living in fear all around us. This kind of news is what evokes a response of praise from me from God when I read God's word, as we just said. Don't be afraid. Do as God says, and he will give you his peace. How many people know that God's peace passes understanding? You look at the hands around you. You can't explain it so easily, but you just know it exists in your life. God gives you some kind of peace amongst all the chaos and turmoil. Well, Philippians 4, 7, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. That's why we talk about Jesus Christ so much. The world uses his name in vain and a curse and a swear word, but we value Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Do you know that peace is not the absence of trouble? Peace is the presence of Jesus Christ. That's what true peace is. And this is something that is being demonstrated by some of the Christians we see in Ukraine right now. As I see some clips being bombarded where they're being dispersed, they're killed, they're separated from loved ones. They're becoming refugees. They're having to pack their suitcases and the kids' bicycles are being left behind their clothes their car, and they're just fleeing. Folks, this is reality. This is what's happening in our world today. We need to pray that God's peace would come upon this world. Where there is faith, there is love. And where there is love, there is peace. And where there is peace, there is God. And when there is God, where there is God, there's no other need. Knowing God for who he really is, that is what evokes our praise for him. If you don't feel like praising God, then you're probably not fixing your mind on him, but on your circumstances and the things of this world. When I see people in countries like North Korea, China, Afghanistan, Russia, and the like, where a lot of communism and persecution from other uh, religious beliefs, Christians being persecuted, but remaining faithful in their praise to God. That really inspires me. Have you seen the Christians in Ukraine holding prayer gatherings? Some are in their churches, some are in their homes. Some are out in the public square. They're praying and they're praising God while their homes are being destroyed. Folks, be thankful that you have a warm home to go to, that you can put food on your table here. These people are praising God in their times of adversity because they know that this world is not our eternal home. Evidence. And we must realize that and put that into perspective. Now, depending on what Bible version you have, you may not find the word evoke in it. But I assure you, just like the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, its meaning is found throughout the entire Bible. The fact that there is a physical and spiritual world, that is the seen and the unseen, which are interrelated, each evoke responses from one another. They help us to understand more about ourselves as physical beings and as God as a spiritual deity. We must not neglect to feed the spiritual life that is within us while living life out in the physical. Our lives are full of carnal, selfish desires and temptations. Friends, feed your soul with spiritual food, and that is God's Word. Purpose in your mind to evoke the presence of God through your praise of Him. Psalm chapter 22, verse 3 says, You are throned. You are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. And that is simply to say, as some of your Bibles will say, God inhabits 
the praises of his people. You know, praise is not something that you muster up in your mind by your actions because of your feelings <laughs> or your thoughts. No. It's what comes from your heart because of your knowledge of who God is and what God has done to save us from hell. If you don't recognize that in your own life, you don't understand who God is. A person who realizes the greatness of God will have a heart that naturally just wants to praise God and is not ashamed of it. You know, there's nothing else we can do to express our thankfulness so deeply than to praise God. And that's why God inhabits our praise. We express our gratitude to God in our praise of Him, and out of our gratitude, we want to and we naturally do good works to fulfill God's purpose. You see, that's what God's will evokes us to do. It's a two-way relationship. Love one another, and we leave judging up to God. Help one another and do unto others what we want them to do to us. That's the love that God calls us to live in this world. I want to say this to the song leaders and the congregation. Of course, that's everybody. We do not make God present through music or our worship time. But we do evoke God's presence when God looks into our heart. And if it's in line with his will, by our surrendering our will to him. We're all human. Preachers can get up with sin in their lives and hypocrisy and preach the word of God. Singer can get up living in all sorts of debauchery and do the outward actions. That's human selfishness. That's human hypocrisy. That's human nature. It happens. There's no such thing as a perfect Christian. But we do follow the example of Jesus Christ, who is perfect. And that's why we preach and teach in his name. There's so much confusion today of what biblical singing and worship is about. Especially many charismatic churches are, are, are guilty of this. You've heard of progressive Christianity. I've spoken that about a few months ago. And it's a current wave of church lifestyle where there's some teaching and a static singing that, in fact, is devoid of God's genuine presence. We're in danger of drifting away from God being the focus of our life to exalting emphasis on being caught up with what makes us feel good. And that's the danger of this progressive Christianity. Whatever makes you feel good and the effects, so you get the fluff, you get all the distracting lights and smoke screens, you get some of that pogo dancing that goes on, and that people assume that that's the presence of God, that it's going to bring in the presence of God, where it's just all humanistic effort to have something that makes themselves feel good. Be in a real relationship with God through having a contrite heart. The human body, animal and animal, mammal life, the universe, the plants, the sun, the planets, the sun, moon, the stars, all rotating in precision. The, the oceans, the lakes, the streams, the mountains, the valleys, and the plains, how they sustain life. When you stop and think about these things, and you stand in awe of God who created and designed them all and put them in a place for purpose, then you begin to understand who God really is. Let God's creation that has order evoke your praise. Our emotions are evoked by what happens in life. Each of us are living testimonies in regard to this. We are shaped by personal life experiences by what we are educated with, by the news, what we see, what we hear. We are influenced by our friends that we put our trust in. I could take you through the entire Bible and show you where each generation has been foretold and therefore forewarned of things to come. And here we are in 2022, so close, I believe, to the end events of the Bible's teachings where Jesus is coming and he's coming very soon. Everything in the Bible is about God's way of explaining life here on earth and how it's all a part of his master plan to overrule the selfish, ungodly desires of mankind and the evil plan of Satan to destroy us and thwart God's plan. People, wherever you are listening or watching this right here, be careful how you live your life. The choices you make will determine your eternal life. And if you don't believe in eternal life, 
Why consider yourself so intelligent while ignoring the advice of God through his word in the Bible that speaks of life and peace and love? To evoke, as we've heard, is to draw out something that is hidden or reserved. It's not like baiting some trick or treat. It has more to do with what's in our heart spiritually. And when you're spiritually in tune with God, you evoke his presence by praising him. And we praise God because of what's in our hearts. If you're not born again, you're hearing this message today. You will not be able to evoke God's presence in your life because God looks at what's in our heart, not our head. He will listen to the sinner. He will listen to the person who's not born again and respond in a sincere prayer. But many people live devoid of God's presence because they don't praise God with the life that God has given them. It's important to understand that God relates to and God relates with us in a most intimate way. And he does this through his son, Jesus Christ, and through his Holy Spirit. Jesus, through the words that are recorded in the Bible and in the flesh as a person, and through the Holy Spirit in and even in a more intimate way through our spirit. That's why Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible teaches. I ask the question, do you know? God? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you have the Holy Spirit living in your life? When you get to understand God through His Holy Spirit that speaks into our carnal spirit, you are then opening yourself to be evoked by God's presence. Motivated by Him to draw nearer to Him and become more like Him. And that is the single most need of all mankind is to come to God and to be more like God. You know, one sure way of evoking the presence of God in your life is by loving one another with God's love. Even those that you don't like because of what something they may have said or done to you. I'm of the belief that understanding who we are in Christ helps answer most of all other questions that anybody will ever have in life. Now, if you're wondering... Why God's presence is so important to us is simply because there is nothing else that can compare to his, its relativity to human life. Because this is where the physical meets with the spiritual. Man and God. Faith. Keep in mind the spiritual world involves evil spirits and godly spirits as well. This is the reality. So ask the person who has lost a lifelong mate what they miss the most. And the answer is invariably presence. When we are ill, we don't need soothing words nearly as much as we need loved ones to be present. What makes a shared life, games, walks, concerts, outings, and a myriad of other things so pleasurable? is presence. To evoke God's presence in your life. I have three things I want to leave with you this morning. Number one is try hard work. Life has become so easy. We've been taught to just take it easy. We've been taking care of things that do our hard work for us, and, and we, we don't experience hard work in our lives so much. It's done for us. Well, let me explain. The hard work here is not so much sweat and tears, calluses. It's resisting evil in our world. That's hard to do. That is the hard work. Because of our nature, we become relaxed and lazy naturally. It's hard work to resist the temptation of the enemy. When you take God's words seriously, you are going to be challenged. Not to sit back and relax, but to be provoked, provoked, sorry, into action in response to the gospel that you read about. And that's why I always say, get into the word of God. It will provoke you. It will evoke you more than just coming to church and hearing the word. I pray for the people who listen to another human teaching and preaching and that's all they get instead of reading the Word of God. If anything, the most important thing you can do is to read the Word of God. And for those who have left the church and you say, well, that's what I do, you're not in relationship with others. You need to read the Word of God and the Word of God will evoke you, provoke you to come to church and be a body, part of the body of Christ no matter how different we are to live together even with some of our different disagreements. Amen? We need the body of Christ to be in fellowship despite our differences. 
and not allow the enemy to split it apart, which he's doing a great job of in this, in this day and age. When people receive their healing from Jesus, they are very often will receive, uh, receive this commission. Mark chapter 5, verse 19, as an example, says, follow me, that is Jesus, after he's healed. Follow me, or go and tell others what the Lord has done for you. When God does something for you, keep following God's word. You, you will understand that by reading. And tell others about him. Share it. Don't hide it. And don't keep it to yourself. The New Testament of the Bible. It consistently shows that when a person recognizes and receives God's blessings, that they evoke a response which is evident in a change of life. That's the whole purpose of God in our lives, to bring change. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2 to 3, it says, We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Paul saw that the inner realities of faith, love, and hope express themselves as outward actions. Faith evokes good works. What good works are you involved with in your life right now? Nothing? Why? Why not? So we need to work hard. Secondly, we need to work with others. It's like, oh, do we really have to do that? You know, I've worked with people and I've worked with machinery. Sometimes I just want to work with machinery because people can be high maintenance. <laughs> nagging, noisy, complaining. Is like. Other times they can be an absolute riot to be with, right? That's life. Work hard, work with others. I want to talk about rugby just for a moment. Just as an illustration, my eldest son plays for the Hamilton Hornets rugby team. And one of the major differences between rugby and football is that it's much harder to be a lone star if you play rugby. You see, in football, the quarter or running back usually gets all the highlights. But in rugby, you can't identify a single person who is the star. Though there will be great individual performances, it is very much a team sport at every point and play. There's so much dependency on your teammates when you play the game of rugby. Christianity. And I'm going to come back to rugby in a minute. Christianity is not about hierarchy. It's about partnership. The Bible says we are to admonish. That is to warn the idol. We just read the scripture. That's why I put it in here today. We are to warn those who are idle and encourage those who are disheartened. So in rugby, in a match, if you know it, the referee will instruct the players in the pack to crouch. That is to kneel. You see them going down. And they bind. They engage. They, if you know the rugby terms, it's, it's ruck or scrum, ruck, or maul, huddle. And it's not a bad set of rules, I was thinking about it, for us as Christians. Kneel. Kneel in prayer every day or whenever it is needed. Bind. Bind to God your heart in prayer and engage with God through your spirit for whatever needs that you might have in your life. Work hard, work with others, and work with God. Paul constantly emphasized two things. The first was that we need to engage actively in the growth of our faith. Are you growing in your faith? I'm growing. Every time I read the Bible, every day, I'm growing, and I don't know how, how many times I've read through the entire Bible. I never stop. When I'm done, I just keep going, and I encourage you to do the same. I think there are some Bible, through the Bible uh, passages out there you can look at. Secondly, God is at work in us doing precisely the same thing, engaging in growth in our faith. So, folks, let God's grace evoke in you a new sense of energy, of purpose, of vision. We need each other for encouragement, reassurance, and correction as we live out our shared lives with one another. As we go to communion, we need to do this to remember God's past intervention 
with humanity. God sent us Jesus to die in our place as we sung this morning. We do this to realize that even now, God is actively involved with what's going on in our world. Even if we don't see any evidence of it, we do this because he promises to come again in Jesus, the Son of God, to set things right and to replace all the lawlessness and unrighteousness with his peace and righteousness. People, let's remember how blessed we are here in Canada, wherever you might be listening. Many places around the world are facing serious turmoil. I came across this saying, David, if I could just get you to hand me my cup there, please, and that pamphlet. If we do not use our freedom to defend our freedom, thank you, we will lose our freedom. If we do not use our freedom to defend our freedom, we will lose our freedom. I'll leave that everybody to themselves to contemplate what that means to you. For us believers here on earth, as bad as things are, for those who refuse Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, life here on earth is as good as it gets. C.S. Lewis said, Has this world been so kind to you that you should leave with regret? There are better things ahead than any we leave behind. I encourage you, I implore you, I'll beg you as a pastor, spend quality time in God's Word. Be alone with God. Turn off your phone, the TV, your friends, I'm busy, and get into a private place and let the Spirit of God speak into your life. Study the Word of God. Don't just read it. Ponder in your heart how it will challenge you. And let God and His Word evoke God's response that motivates you to become more like Him and less like the world. If you want to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you want to carefully open your communion cups at this time, the wafers in the top level and the juice is on the second level there, Give you a moment to get this ready. Why do we do communion? Why do we do the Lord's Supper? Or some people call it the Eucharist. Again, it's about things that have taken place in the past. It's about things that are currently taking place in the world, and it's about the future. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And God sent Jesus Christ down in human flesh through a virgin to grow up as deity in flesh. God in flesh. That's what Jesus is. And he lived the sinless life as an example for everybody read up, to see during the time he lived here, to be recorded as it is in the word of God. And Jesus said, as God has sent me when I go, I will send the Holy Spirit. So God is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right now, the Bible says through its many prophetic foretelling that what's happening in our world today is precisely what God's word said would happen in the end days. And this has been going on for quite a long time now, but it's getting more and more and more intense. And more of the prophecies are coming to being. And I'll tell you this, just to pique your interest, if you're listening online, you may not understand this, but if you read the Word of God, it will come to light. This flag here is the flag of Israel. Israel is the apple of God's eye. Israel is not a perfect nation. The Old Testament is full of its mistakes where God's blessing was taken from them because they ignored God. But as a covenant that God made with that nation, a covenant that will not be broken, there has always been a remnant of people. And the miracle of Israel today, if you study its history, how it has been attacked and outnumbered, how it survived, how it plays into the future where Jesus will come again to rule. 
Some people just think here's another fable. Well, that is your free will. Exercise it as you want. But don't do it without reading the Word of God to allow the Holy Spirit to convict you of truth. That, I think, is why a lot of people don't read the Word of God. And the enemy will say, well, it's so boring in that. Well, start reading maybe in the book of John. Look at the book of Romans. Go into the Psalms or the Proverbs. Maybe you want to start there. And ask the Holy Spirit if this is truth to convict you. And I believe God's Word will evoke a response into you. But you will never know until you sit down and open the pages of God's Word to get to know Him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it talks about the Lord's Supper. It says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which He was betrayed, He took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This, take this, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This wafer represents Jesus as the bread of life. Jesus said those very words. We can live off of food to get by physically. But if we're going to sustain our life spiritually, we have to live by the word of God. There's no room for hypocrisy here, folks. You need to repent before you, because this is a believer's uh, communion. It's where you're saying, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Don't be taking this because everyone else is, or it's the thing to do, the Christian thing. This, this doesn't make you a Christian. Being baptized in water doesn't make you a Christian. You, you don't have to speak in tongues to be a Christian. So many false teachings going on in the world. They will all be clarified if you will read the Word of God for yourself. We provide teachings as well. I encourage you to come to them. Folks, time is short. And as we read these scriptures, do this in remembrance of me. When Jesus was hung on that cross, he was innocent. He was perfect in every way. And he went to the cross on purpose for you and I. And he died a death that should have been ours. And that's what God wants us to recognize when we take this communion. We say, thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Your body was torn apart, literally. If you, if you want to study what a Roman crucifixion was about, the most cruel, agonizing way. That's what Jesus willingly did for you and for me. Let that sink in, people. Let that sink in. No greater love is there than what one would lay down his life for another. And that's what Jesus has done for us. And none of us are worthy. But by the grace of God, here we are. Because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Let us take it. The time given here in church isn't enough to just contemplate what I'm saying here from 1 Corinthians 11. There's three other places in the Bible where it talks about the Lord's Supper. And I encourage you, don't get so busy or in a routine where it keeps you from getting into God's Word. This will revolutionize your life. I'm talking about the Spirit of God, the Word of God. The, the whole Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Written by different authors, but everything that is here is what God wants us to read here today. So as we look at verse 25, it says, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The old covenant, you're wondering, what is it? Well, the old covenant is found in the Old Testament. You'll read about it. The sacrifice of animals. And they had to be perfect without blemish. But that was just a temporary cover. Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament. And so that's why we celebrate. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Until... Jesus comes again, soon and very soon. The signs are there until Jesus comes again. Let us drink. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's right here in the Word of God to do this. It's so that we don't forget. It's to remind us. Don't get caught up in the things of the world. God is real. Jesus Christ is real. The Holy Spirit is real. And if you don't know that, 
You ask God to reveal himself to you, and he won't disappoint you. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Are you ready for Jesus to come? Are you ready? People, get ready. As I've been saying for a couple of years, things are going to get tougher for us because the Word of God says that. Are you ready? Don't lose hope. Don't lose faith. Be the strength in the world that people need at your work, wherever you are. If you're retired, may they see you as a neighbor, as a relative, that you have a faith that is unshakable and that it is in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Word. Thank you, Lord, that Get back to more of what we are experienced, Lord. I just pray that we can live freer, Lord, that, God, we can get the word out there. Lord, we pray for the situation in Ukraine, Lord, the tents between Taiwan and China, Lord, and all this stuff we're hearing. We don't really know what's going on, but thank God you do. Lord, we pray for Sean, Lord, in despair, that, God, that he will get the help he needs. Lord, we pray for the people here who have unsaved loved ones and around the world as they're listening in. We speak their name. And Jesus, may they come to know you as their Lord and Savior. To live in your peace amongst all the chaos in this world. Because it is well with my soul. And we put our trust in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.